Good morning, church. It's good to be with you once again. Glad that you're here taking the time to prioritize God in your life. Whether you be a single person at home, whether you be a couple at home, whether you be a family gathering together at home, we may be distant from one each other physically, but we are together spiritually, and that's what life's all about in this sense. So come. Now is the time for us to worship. Come. Now is the time to worship. Come. Now is the time to give your heart. Come. Just as you are to worship. Come. Just as you are before your God. Come. Here's today's first dose of what I hope is God's word for you today that you can latch on to forever. If you've heard me say before, you know what I'm about to say. If you know it, say it with me. If not, pay attention and learn it for yourself. God loves you and there is absolutely nothing you can do about that. That's the good news, that God loves us and there's nothing we can or have to do about that. With that as a backdrop. Let's enter into a time of prayer. Dear God, it's a strange kind of world we're living in these days. There's darkness around us in certain ways. There's isolation in other ways. We yearn to be together and yet understand we need to stay apart for the sake of the well-being of all. At this time, as we would normally be entering into Holy Week and the season of Easter together, we begin that journey individually by ourselves today. But we know that you are with us. We know that we will get through this time. We know that the experiences of Holy Week continue to happen for us. Today, as we celebrate Palm Sunday. On Thursday, as we go through Monday, Thursday, and we remember Jesus giving us the commandment to love one another. Good Friday when we will understand once again what it means to sacrifice one's life for others. And next Sunday on Easter, even though we won't be together, we will celebrate the resurrection, the new life that you make possible. Help us to see it in our everyday lives, always present, always available. We thank you for this time together. We celebrate you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. So before we go any further, I want to talk about the spiritual discipline of stewardship for just a moment. Normally we have an offering in the midst of the worship service, but because of how we're doing worship these days, we don't have the opportunity to have a time of giving. And yet giving and generosity is an important part of what it means to be a Christian. And so I lift up before you today the importance of continuing to give, to be supportive of the church, its ministries, and the kingdom of God that it seeks to create. One of those reasons for doing that is because we're continuing to pay our entire staff, even though they cannot be physically present doing their work. We believe this is a social justice issue, and it's an act of compassion to care for them and their families. And so that's just one illustration of why the spiritual discipline of stewardship is important for us to recognize and to commit to today. In whatever ways you can, give to your church. Donate in the mail. Figure out a way to send a check however you can, because we need the support to care for people and to develop God's kingdom as we like. May the spiritual discipline of stewardship be a spiritual discipline that we commit to willingly, graciously, and with all kinds of intent. Thanks for letting me make that word before you today. So let's get into the message now. You know, life is about choices. We all know that and understand that. Every day we have to make hundreds of choices. Some of them are simple and small. Others of them are more demanding, sometimes even challenging beyond any level that we would like to, to commit to. 
but there are always consequences to the choices we make. Making choices is just an important part of life. Here's some examples of that. As I was getting ready for today, I uh, had to decide what I was going to wear. I was going to wear my black merino wool button shirt that I love. Or because it's a special week in the church calendar when I put on a coat and a tie. Well, you can see I didn't choose either one of those. I remembered that I had this green shirt in my closet. And when I got to it, I remembered not only that it was green, but it had palms on it. What better shirt to wear on Palm Sunday than a green shirt with palms on it? We have to make choices every day right now also in terms of will we adhere to social distancing? Will we stay confined in our homes in an attempt to reduce the risk of this coronavirus? Or will we venture out? Go ahead and do some things that are normal and say, oh, well, but then put other people at risk. It's a choice that we get to make, that we have to make. What about the attitudes that we have in terms of living life? Do we approach life from an abundance mentality, believing that there's enough resource, enough potential, enough giftedness to accomplish anything that needs to be done and that we want to make happen? Or do we approach life from the perspective of scarcity, believing that there's just never enough to get things done, that there's this dark cloud hanging over us that's keeping us limited, believing that somehow God can't break through? What's your perspective on life? It's a choice. Is it abundance mentality or scarcity mentality? I'm going to throw a fun one in here now. What about this choice? I've got a project that's going to take 30 days to accomplish, and I need a couple, I need somebody to work with me and get it done. Now, this is imaginary, but, you know, take it seriously. I'm willing to pay you to be involved in this project with me. I can either pay you $60 million right up front for 30 days of your efforts, or I can pay you in this fashion. I can give you $1 the first day, $2 on the second day, $4 on the third day, $8 on the fourth day. You get it, the progression all the way through to the end of the project, 30 days worth. Consider, which choice will you make? Will you take the upfront or will you take the dollar and the amount doubled every day? Hold on to your thought. We'll come back to that a little bit later. And then the last choice that I was thinking about as I was putting this message together was this one. Uh, do we celebrate Holy Week and all the events leading up to Easter as we normally would this year and say we're done? Or could we choose to put the essence, the fullness of Holy Week, even though we'll acknowledge it today and next week, can we put the whole celebration part aside? Can we say that once we're released from this uh, bondage of having to be home and needing to be home, once we're free to be back in the building and move freely about in life, we're going to have a real sense of resurrection, are we not? Can we choose to wait and have our Holy Week and Easter celebration when that time arrives? I can only speak for myself, but I'm going to choose to say, let's do the second one. Let's wait till we're set free. Let's have resurrection in all kinds of ways once that day arrives. Well, just some things to think about because the reality is choices are always all around us. On this Palm Sunday, it's important to remember that Jesus had to make choices too. On this particular day in his life, he had to make some very intentional choices. One was, would he go into the city and start the process, the movement towards his death? Or would he choose to stay outside? Would he say, I think it's more important to continue the ministry, to continue to spread the word, to, to be out among the people? He had to make a choice one way or the other. And then he had to decide if he's going into the city, how is he going to go in? The uh, emperors and all the significant conquerors and all the Big leaders, if you will, when they entered the city, came in on white stallions. It was a, a symbol 
of their success, of their importance. Jesus said, that's a choice I could make. Or, as he did, he chose instead to come in on a borrowed donkey. Talk about humility. Talk about a downplaying of his entry. That was his desire, and that's what he chose, regardless of how the crowd reacted. And the last choice was, will he present himself as a new king, a new political leader? Would he be the, the face of this new movement to overthrow Caesar and the oppression that the people had been living under? Or would he choose to come in and say, I'm a humble servant. I'm not about taking over. I'm about being there with you and for you. You see, Jesus had some significant choices to make on Palm Sunday. Yeah, I've said it, I'll say it again. Life is about choices. And they always impact who we are, what we are, and how our life is going to be structured. For Jesus, those choices started when he was conceived, continued as he entered this world, and then began his teaching ministry and calling people into the movement that we now know of as Christianity. Philippians chapter 2 begins to describe who and what Jesus chose to be, and the principles and the values that he felt were most important for people to choose. Philippians chapter 2 puts it this way, Jesus did not count equality, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, or exploited. In other words, I'm not simply going to be this grandiose, amazing God figure. He chose instead to humble himself, to become an everyday human being, to live life in the human dimension. And thereby he emptied himself, as it goes on to say in Philippians, and became obedient, obedient in terms of being a servant. Jesus made some clear choices, and it defined who and what he was because of that. And then when it came to his teachings, he had some clear choices to make. What kind of values would he hold up? What kinds of principles would he say should be at the center of our lives? If you want a good, clear picture of what that is for Jesus, all you need to do is look at Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, what we refer to as the Sermon on the Mount, and especially that opening part of chapter 5 that we call the Beatitudes, where Jesus said these are the values, the principles, the states of being that will cause you to feel blessed and to be a blessing to others. He described it this way. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who are peacemakers. Choose these dimensions and your life will be better, he said. They kind of fly in the face of what culture and society wants to tell us, doesn't it? Yes, Jesus had choices to make. And he made clear, distinct choices along the way. And he invited us as his disciples to make similar kinds of choices. Hoping that we would approximate life the way he approached life. Now, remember that choice I asked you to make earlier? Do you want to choose 60 million up front or do you want to take the doubling of the money on a daily basis for 30 days? Let me help you understand the difference between the two. I'm going to show you clearly the surprising difference between taking the 60 million up front, which most of us probably are inclined to say, I'll choose that one, and the other option that I put before you. Look at it this way. Don't worry about my face. Let's look at it this way. If you choose to take the dollar and let it be multiplied every day for 30 days, what you'll discover is that at the end of the 26th day, you've gotten a little more than the 60 million already. 
But over the next four days, catch this, you'll have received another one billion, with a B, a billion dollars more. Clearly the choices we make have an impact on life. Sometimes even more than we realize. Okay, let's get back to Palm Sunday now. Palm Sunday is the day when the crowd waved their palms as Jesus came by. Let's picture ourselves waving our palms today, okay? And let's, let's decide what that waving of palms is really all about. Is it about honoring our Jesus, our choice maker, our model of true commitment and the kind of choices that should be made? as those who call ourselves Christians? Is that the kind of palm waving we're willing to do today? It was the kind of palm waving choice that Jesus made, his values and his principles that set the stage for what we now know of as Christianity. The humble servant, the one who did not count himself an equal to God, is that the kind of person we're waving and honoring today? Let's be certain we understand that as we wave, lest we become like the crowd on Good Friday, who said, one day we're with you and we honor you, and the next day we turn our backs on you because we're not ready to commit to the kind of life that you're asking of us. Yes, friends, if we're going to wave our palm branches today, let's make sure we're waving them for humility. Let's make sure we're waving them for the spirit of self-sacrifice. Let's wave them in our commitment to the good of all and for being servants who choose to care for others. Let's wave our branches for the spirit of acceptance and forgiveness and compassion and not judgment and anger and rejection. Let's wave to proclaim what we said at the beginning of this service, that God loves us, every single one of us, and loves us equally, every single one of us. And there's nothing that we can do about that. Nothing except the fact that we will accept that God loves us. And so it brings me to the kind of ultimate question that I want us to ponder this morning. And that question is this, what do we really want for our lives? What do we really want to be the core of our existence? Jesus had to ask and answer that question for himself. And that's what he began to do on Palm Sunday. And he did throughout what we now refer to as Holy Week. He answered the question clearly for himself. What do I really want? And the answer was this. I want God's will more than anything. God's will. Nothing more. Nothing less. Nothing else. That's what Jesus chose to base his life on. I choose God's will. Nothing more. Nothing less, nothing else. What does that mean for us in practical terms if that's the choice we make today? That what we want, what we really want more than anything is God's will? It means we will become even more humble than we may be right now. That we'll make sure that other people's needs are every bit as valuable and maybe even more important than meeting our own needs. Even when we go to the grocery store. We'll only take one of any particular item if we really need it, but we won't take items that we don't need. No, there'll be no hoarding among us who follow Jesus. Humbleness is what we will choose. And we'll choose servanthood. We'll look for ways on a daily basis for how we can serve the people in our own homes that we're living with. 
We'll choose to find ways creatively to care for our neighbors. We'll choose to be servants in fun kind of ways even. Let me give you an example of that. This uh, last week we had this hunger for some dessert and we realized that we had this uh, pie in the freezer. And so Cheryl took it out and baked it and oh, it was so good. But we didn't need a whole pie. And so we cut about a quarter, maybe a third of it, put it on a paper plate, went down the steps of our door to the, our next door neighbors, our family from Germany that we've got to know and love so well over the past few years. And we rang the doorbell and stepped back and put our hands out and said, here, here's a little gift for you, and then walked away. It was a great feeling to serve somebody else in just a fun way. And then lo and behold, a couple days later, what happened? We got a text, come down to your door. There's something right there for you. We went down, opened the door, and what was there? Yep, two pieces, two big pieces of cheesecake from the Cheesecake Factory. Now, I don't know how they got them. I don't ask questions. I just graciously accept them. And we brought them up and ate them in honor of our friends and out of the love that they showed us. Yeah, servanthood can be fun, and it's a part of the choice I hope we'll make. And the last part is about obedience. Let's choose to be obedient in the same spirit that Jesus was. Let's put it in practical terms now. Obedience may look like this. Staying home. Yeah, that's right. Not venturing out. Staying home. Maintaining the social distance. It means washing our hands regularly, multiple times every day to help minimize the risk of infection or passing infection on to somebody else. As I thought about how to make that practical, I thought of something. We've used the Lord's Prayer at the end of worship each two weeks, and I taught you some motions to the Lord's Prayer. Well, today I want to put the Lord's Prayer into another set of motions, if you will. I want to use it in a mundane kind of way. There's nothing wrong with that. In a mundane kind of way. In a life-giving kind of way. The Lord's Prayer. While we're washing our hands. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Yeah, you'll have really clean hands because that'll take a good 20 seconds like they're saying we should be doing. But you'll also be putting a spiritual dimension into those washing of those hands. And it'll make all the difference in the world. Yeah, let's be about obedience as followers of Jesus Christ. The ultimate question became, what do you want more than anything? And what will you choose to make your life based on? Well, our good friend in the Old Testament, a man by the name of Joshua, in the 24th chapter, verse 5, answered that basic question. And he answered it this way. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Because we want God's will more than anything else in our lives. It's what Jesus chose. That's what we can choose. Will we choose to make God's will? Nothing more. Nothing less. Nothing else, the basis of our lives. I pray that that's the choice we'll make every single day. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still, have thine own way, Lord. 
in our lives that we may be your people doing your will nothing more nothing less nothing else hey thanks for being with us in worship this morning i hope something has spoken to you in a way that's helpful or that inspires you hopefully we'll see you again next sunday one other thing i want to just lay out though before we bring this to a close and that is that uh, on monday thursday thursday right before easter i want to try something i want to venture out in a risky kind of way uh, we have this zoom opportunity that a lot of people are participating in right now if you have access to zoom i invite you to consider being a part of a monday thursday zoom worship service at 7 p.m if you'd like to be a part of that send me a message Send me a message to J Biste, J B I S T A Y I at ymail.com or text me. No, just email. I need your email address and that'll get it to me. First 50 people who get to me saying I want in, just put yes, I'm in. I'll make sure you get an invite in through the Zoom app to being with us on Monday, Thursday at 7 p.m. for a special worship time. Matt's going to close this service in just a moment with a piano rendition of Have Thine Own Way. As he plays, let your heart be in tune with the melody that is there. Be God's will, my friends. Be about God's will. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Have a blessed week. Amen. <laughs>